Hey guys, thanks for tuning in. In this series, we're gonna be saving this mechanically totaled BMW. All right guys, you're looking at a 2013 F30 BMW 328i with the N20 motor. And this car was mechanically totaled out at a dealership and it's here to be saved. The issue on this car is the timing chain. Let me demonstrate. It sounds horrible, so I can't really run it for too long. We don't wanna risk skipping any additional teeth or anything like that, but I think this will be helpful to help you guys figure out if your engine's about to go because of your timing chain. So that wasn't very hard to make out. You got a drivetrain malfunction. I think when the car is trying to adjust valve timing, it realizes that it's way out of whack and the chain loses tension. And that's when you get that. And then it tries to just lock the cams and then it gets a little bit quieter to regain some tension on that chain. If you were to shut it off while it's making that terrible racket, then the chain would be loose. If you shut it off after it adapts, then, uh, with the drivetrain malfunction and it tightens itself back up. So it probably has to do with valve timing and potentially low oil pressure. So I'm gonna talk while I work because I'm gonna remove the stuff that's gonna be in the way. Uh, to start with, some people asked me to do this DIY because I bought a B28 project car and then we found this car, which is not my car, I'm fixing it for someone, but it was sitting due to this mechanical failure. Might as well show one that's failed and try to save it rather than just prevent the maintenance. You can see how bad it can get. So this is a 2013, it has the electronic wastegate, so there's no vacuum diaphragm built into the engine cover, so you can just pull it straight up, take out your sound deadening, pull this wire out of the seal. Looks like whoever diagnosed it just kind of put it back so 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 the story with this car is it was smoking on startup he took it to the dealer they told him it needs a new turbo and recommended that he do the oil pan gasket he did the oil pan gasket but not the turbo because it was like six thousand dollars for a new turbo plus labor and all that when he authorized the oil pan gasket job when they pulled the pan down they found bits of timing guide material in there and they said it's critical you should fix the timing chain right now he didn't authorize it he wasn't really sure if he wanted to spend that money obviously it's expensive at the dealer and they told him it's very critical make sure you do it if you want to take your car you're kind of taking a chance he started to develop a really high-pitched whine while driving like a gear sound like a remote control car kind of sound as the car warmed up and then contacted the dealer and they said you know what it's too late too far gone we recommend you replace the engine it's probably mechanically totaled it was already mechanically totaled when they recommended that he do the turbo which we know is due to the oil feed line flaw where it doesn't have a check valve which could be fixed for 40 something dollars, but it was already mechanically totaled when he picked it up with the oil pan gas because they wanted 14 grand, more than it's worth. So I guess he was in a predicament. He wasn't sure what to do. The car wasn't worth as much as they wanted to charge for repairs. I think he was gonna get a second opinion. Some time went on. Next thing you know, that timing chain gear sound turned into a rattling sound and the drivetrain malfunction. There's a little rivet missing here. They never put that back. There was skipping and uh, missing and rattling sound. Car felt rough to drive. He basically decided it's now time to park it. He was getting low oil pressure warnings. That is where I told him, okay, if there's low oil pressure warnings, that's actually really bad. It's probably what we didn't want to see. It could be due to the oil pickup getting filled up with bits of timing chain guide and blocking it. And if you drove it hard at all or for a prolonged period of time like that, it could have damaged the engine. So then I went to check the oil filter before we proceeded with anything further and found that the oil filter was perfectly clean, which is what we need here. So I called him up and I asked him, well, how much did you drive on it when it started to sound really terrible and you got the oil pressure warning? He's like, basically, that was the last time I drove it. I basically parked it right that moment. I'm like, okay, good move. That probably saved it. The dealer didn't want to touch it. They just wanted to throw a motor in it after he took it away without doing the timing chain job at that time. I actually found this car on Facebook and I was interested in buying it, but then I found a cheaper F30 that needed a turbo and I figured, you know what, well, we'll grab that and we'll do this job preventative. But then that car is perfectly fine, even with higher mileage. So for now, this makes more sense to help someone out, save them some money, potentially make a series, help you guys out. And I guess show you a worst case scenario. I'm going after the clamp that holds the air box to the mast. I've seen some other DIYs on this job, but not, I'd like this video not to be crazy long. So the obvious stuff like removing the air box and stuff can just be skipped over relatively quickly in my opinion. So it had been a few months. I had talked to him about buying it. He reached out saying, hey, what do you think about repairing this for me? 
he had seen my channel and I said, we can look into that. He sent it over from Austin a couple hours away and here it is, we're gonna try to save it. I told him I would let him know if it's not worth it, if the engine's too far gone. I didn't see that. It didn't seem too far gone. These are E18s for the brace. You could leave this in technically if you wanted to kind of work, wiggle around it, but it's not a big deal to remove it. The plan was when this car arrived, I was gonna run it for a few minutes and give the turbo a chance to burn off any oil. Given the way it sounds, I don't wanna do that. It's just too cringe. I don't want something else to break. So we're gonna have to just cross our fingers on the turbo, put the new feed line, see how things go. Worst case, I have a turbo here that has good seals, just needs a wastegate rebuild, we could do that. This is the first car I've worked on that wasn't mine for the channel. The timing chain issue on these cars is a big deal and a lot of people stay away from them. But they're a nice car to drive. They're very torquey and good on gas. I've been putting miles on mine. It's a great daily driver. If it wasn't for this timing chain issue, plaguing them would be a really good car. Once this is fixed, the hopes is he's going to continue to use it for a few years. It only has 98,000 miles on it. So 150 should be fine in terms of trying to ride it through for the injectors, high pressure fuel pump. You know, the, the typical stuff that would go on these cars. that out it's gonna be in the way could have probably got away with leaving that in but not a big deal on a nice clear access we have access to the crank pulley bolt next up we'll focus on removing the valve cover and then we'll raise the car up and drop the oil pan set our timing tool on there and whatnot I'm going after electrical connectors where I see them you have the high pressure fuel pump connector I'm inserting a pick tool on the side of the fuel injectors I'm lifting straight out going after the coil doing the eight mil on top of the injector bracket for the coil ground. Popping off the harness, off the valve cover. Using a 17 to crack the high pressure fuel pump lines. Release that slowly, it'll be under pressure. Two T30 bolts. And we're releasing slowly because it could be under spring tension. Pull that out of the way. Going after these two E7s. We'll pop out these O2 sensor harnesses. Two more E7s back here. For the bracket that holds down your engine cover. There's a little tab you can push in for the harness. Disconnecting the oxygen sensors. Now right, we're gonna bring that right out of the way. We go disconnect the battery in the trunk, popping this out of the valve cover bracket. Going after these E8s on top for the injectors. There's an electrical connector for this rail. And then there's these fuel injector lines, 14s, crack those free. We'll disconnect these cam sensors. Take these out, these are E7s. A little hard to make up, but we gotta squeeze on the sides here and pull out the brake booster line. And lift it up and out of the way. I'm using a T30 Allen key to go behind there and release three T30s. That's the vacuum pump removed. I'm gonna go after the valve cover bolts now, starting from the center. So if I had to guess the cause of the failure, there's a ton of sludge on these springs here. So it probably is based on following the recommended oil change interval and getting premature wear on the plastic components. That's probably the difference between one car with low mileage versus one car with high mileage, or it could be heat cycling. Lots of short trips versus long trips, stuff like that. But there's sludge, nothing crazy. And there's good even wear on the cams. Let's take a look at the oil filter next. Looking inside there, I don't see any flakes at all. You just see some bubbles that are evaporating, but yeah, definitely not what you'd be seeing if there was catastrophic engine failure, which is a good sign here. It's probably just restricted oil pressure. Maybe we're gonna find some bits of timing chain guide in the oil pickup, but all in all, they didn't drive very much, but this is a good way to grenade the engine. If you have a restricted oil pickup, first thing I would check if you have this sound is, do you have shavings? Because you may spin a bearing. As far as I know, the last oil change was done at the dealer because they did the oil pan gasket, but look at that, there's an O-ring just sitting on the filter. 
They put a new one, but they probably let that fall in there by accident and didn't get it out. There's the filter. I haven't cut it up open or anything, but there's definitely no red flags, so this can be safe. Now look inside there, we're in good shape and the cage is in place. So the oil pressure wasn't caused from that. You know, all in all, very good sign, zero metallic particles. So getting to the point of pulling the valve cover didn't take very long, not a bad job, and the crank pulley, etc. Next up, using a 16 mil, we're gonna release the serpentine belt by rotating it clockwise and just pull it off. This car needs a belt, as you can see. Now I'm gonna go after the crank pulley. There's six E10s. I'm getting ready to install the locker tool. There's two little slots here. Right now they're facing vertically, but they gotta be horizontal and lined up together uh, while the, the intake and exhaust cam are not compressing the valve. That should be TDC. And I have both QR codes up and the valves are not being touched. That means that we're at TDC compression stroke. Okay, so I would lock down these two bolts and leave these loose. It'll be a neutral position. I'll just tighten these down and it'll lock everything into place. I got this locking tool for $68 on Amazon. I'll put a link in the description. So cylinder one TDC compression stroke is when both cams have the QR codes facing up with the horizontal slats on the side at 90 degree angles and the valves are not being compressed, meaning it's not on the exhaust stroke, it's on the compression stroke. Now, if you wanted to verify your timing, you could bring this tool into place and you'll see there's holes on the Vanos adjusters. That's lined up there. That's lined up there. If I slide this into place, it's perfectly timed. So we know we're good. Going after the vibration dampener. It's a Texas car, so it should come off relatively easily. Your luck may vary depending on what climate you're in. Gonna have to remove these cam sensors. These are held in by E7s. Over on this side, we won't be able to remove the chain tensioner unless we take out the electronic wastegate to get it out of the way. So I used a T40 on an Allen to get that out. That's good enough just to get it out of our way. All right, now we're done from above. We're gonna raise the car up and go from underneath. I'm gonna take off the wheels so the subframe isn't so weighted when I lower it a bit. I'm gonna start by doing the obvious, removing the under tray. Unfortunately, this is pretty much a, an impossible shot, but there's a plastic plug that goes into the block that covers up where you'd put your locking pin to lock the crankshaft into position. So I was able to get that piece out. I just grabbed a long set of pliers like this, went through here, and you can just get on it. Uh, it's right around the bell housing area. Now we'll install the locking tool in that place. It's hard to make out, but as you can see, I just put the flywheel locker in place. To take this cover off as well, What I've done is popped off this access cover. I have the tool going from the side of the block and I was trying to verify that it's gone through to the flex plate through the hole to lock everything in position that I would install my other locking tool. Flywheel lock tool is fully seated now. Basically just move the flex plate from here until I could push this all the way in. And then I verified that it's fully locked up at the front by turning the 22 mil nut. Now we're gonna use a locking tool here. I'm on the front crank hub bolt, I'm gonna release it. In preparation for lowering the subframe, I'm using a tow hook from an E90. It threads right in. The one from this car does not work. Now we can go down underneath the car and unclip the coolant lines from the subframe disconnect the electrical connectors for the power steering system and loosen the six bolts that hold the subframe up to the car and go after the oil pan. If you look right there, there's a 13 mil that's bolting between the steel subframe and the front aluminum supports, one on each side. That's why I lowered this uh, cover here in preparation for dropping the subframe. So I'll take that out now. 
I've unclipped the coolant lines from the subframe. Next, we're gonna disconnect the electrical connectors for the power steering. Next up, we'll unscrew the motor mounts, E12s. Check out the subframe bolts. We have 18 mils at the back and we have E14s up at the front, total of six. I'm gonna lower the jack now and lower the subframe. Subframe's just hanging by the suspension, which is perfectly fine. We don't have any stretch harnesses or nothing. It's pretty simple on this car. We're just creating enough room to be able to pull the oil pan out. So I'm gonna disconnect the oil level sensor and go after the bolts on the oil pan. All these are E8s. It was hard to make out, but there's lines bolted to the pan. Using E8 socket, it's kind of hard to get it in there. You have to wiggle it and really fight to get it on the bolt. But that, there's one there and there's one at the back. So I just completely removed the driver's side motor mount because I won't be able to get access to one of the bolts on the oil pan. We're gonna have to release the arm as well, at least loosen it up a bit to get enough slack to be able to undo that last blocked bolt. And so it's a tough shot, but I got the motor mount loosened the arm for the motor mount. I went to the top and I used a long extension with the universal joint to slack in the top two E12s and then I completely removed the bottom two E12s just so I can get access to one bolt on the oil pan. All right, so there's the oil pan removed. So this engine had very little oil in it. I barely drained any out of it. it really shouldn't have been running that way. I didn't really idle it or anything, but uh, no metallic shavings or anything along those lines or anything caught in the filter. Thankfully, so the engine is savable. But we'll just dig through here, see if we can find any pieces of anything. So this oil pan was already dropped by the dealer and they told him uh, to do this job at that time, but also Give him a bill for $14,000 for new turbo and all this other stuff. But, you know, there was a bunch of this in there. They found that at that time. And now there's more in here. But, you know, I guess this would be a typical case scenario. So, yeah, bits of uh, time and chain material. I'll get this cleaned up and we'll pull the old assembly out shortly. All right, so forgive the mess, but I got a status update for you guys. Now, like I said, there was very little oil in the engine, which was a little concerning. But, you know, we marched on. And I found out that the turbo is completely shot. This is the cartridge I took off. And if you're wondering, I took it off to update the oil feed line because uh, it was reported that this car was smoking. Here's what we got. It's a dead turbo. This is what came out on the back side. There's the seal. So the turbo was just cooking through oil to the point where it lost so much oil that the uh, vano system wasn't working properly, etc. So, you know, I checked for wear, I checked for shavings in the engine oil, I checked for shavings in the filter, etc. There's literally no wear. Engine looks good otherwise, so luckily everything's fine. This turbo failure was one of the main reasons why this car was getting totaled out mechanically, but luckily I have a spare turbo. Once again, special thanks to a subscriber named Keegan Curry that sent me his turbo because of the wastegate being worn out on mine. That part of the turbo is mint perfect. This part of the turbo is perfect on this. Nowhere at all. So we're in good shape there. I'm going to take this piece over and move it onto that existing housing where the wastegate is still in good shape. And we'll save this car with my old turbo, which is still in perfect condition. Doesn't smoke or nothing. So here's the upgraded turbo feed line. I would have liked to be able to show you how to just update this by itself, but I got to be mindful of how long I have the car. It's somebody else's car and I can't film at all because it takes more than twice as long when you're filming. You basically leave the exhaust manifold on the engine and take off the lines and the V-band clamp that holds the front part and pull it out to be able to get that turbo feed line installed. I also did the oil filter housing gasket. Would have liked to be able to show you a DIY, but it's not a true DIY because I'm in the middle of another job. But I pulled the ECU off the intake manifold and removed the intake manifold, moved it over a bit, took out the oil filter housing, changed both seals and put it back together. So just like the title said, this car was mechanically totaled based on the turbo, the timing assembly, the oil pan gasket, the oil filter housing gasket, etc. Doesn't take much to total one of these cars out and they got to get in the hands of the DIYers to save them. So that would have been the likely fate of this car would have ended up in a DIYer's hand. But regardless, uh, let's get it back on the road. All right, guys, I think this will be a good stopping point. This is going to be part one of saving this BMW that's mechanically totaled. In the next series, we'll get it back on the road. If this is the first video you're catching on mine, please consider subscribing. I do upload regularly. If you liked it, please give it a like so it'll rank higher. Thanks for watching.